Welcome to the Weird Libertarians presidential series debates. This is a part, this is a series of 10 debates with every candidate for president formally invited to participate and provide their ideas on a variety of issues. Uh, let's see here today. I'm joined by William Hurst, Kim Ruff, Daniel Taxation is Theft Berman, Arvin Vora, Christopher Mikes, Mark, <laughs> Christopher Mikes, Christopher Marks, and Benjamin Letter. Uh, and we will be discussing large economic systems. Our final, uh, our final ep episode of the whole series will cover smaller, more intricate systems, so don't lose your cool if you don't hear the questions that you want to hear answered about the economy. You'll have two minutes to answer the, the questions. At the end of your allotted time, I will simply say time, and please wrap, wrap up your thought quickly. If you are done before... Uh, before you, but the two-minute timer goes off, you may simply say, "I yield my time," and we'll we'll move on. While I am a libertarian, I have designed these questions to be challenging. and have modeled both the questions and the format after the major presidential debates, not the friendly ones that you may be used to. My audience will be tasked with evaluating the quality of your responses. I will be judging you based on how prepared you are for the challenges I propose how well you understand the questions that I set before you, how well you manage your time, and how compelling your answers are to make all Americans, and not just libertarians, want to vote for you. At the end, you'll be given three minutes to issue a closing statement, which you may use to summarize your feelings on the economy, challenge an oppo opponent's response to a question, and or address an issue that you don't feel got brought up adequately during the debate. Candidates, here we go. The most easily identified motto of a libertarian is that taxation is theft. However, there are currently thousands of programs that are required to, uh, by law to fund, most of which cannot be overturned at the federal level. Assuming that not all of these programs can be overturned, how would you handle taxation in the meantime? And fittingly, my random list wants to ask uh, Daniel Berman first. Sure. So um, I guess I'm the expert on that subject uh, mm -hmm. by name. Um, really, you know, it's it's a really interesting question. And, and people ask me and they ask other libertarians all the time, without taxes, how would you build the roads? And what they're really asking is, yeah, how do you fund all these programs that are currently funded with taxes? And it's a great question because there are so many different ways to fund different projects. And even with roads, roads themselves are so di diverse that different roads are going to be funded in different ways. Um, but what's really important about this question is that we start to think, if we take taxation off the table, how can we fund these projects voluntarily? And there are plenty of ways, and we just need to start thinking about it. The problem is that mostly when government says, hey, we need a, we have a problem we need to fix, or you know, we need something that do we, we want to make the community better, um, the first thing that they do is they say, well, it's easy. We'll just pay for it with taxes. And all they do is raise taxes, and, and that's the easy thing. But if you take that off the table, you can start to think about, you know, how can we actually do this? And I've proposed plenty of solutions for different things, but it's it's really important that we as a society start to look at that and say, yeah, taxation is bad and we should start looking at voluntary ways of funding all these programs. And then we can start, you know, moving into a more voluntary society. Of course, at the federal level, we'll be able to cut back the, the, um, the IRS immediately and get rid of a lot of wasteful programs. But at the local level, it's really gonna be up to the people to figure out how to do that in their in their states and communities. Awesome. Thank you very much. And we will move on to Mr. Arvind Vora. I want to disagree with a uh, part of your question, Hody. Uh, you said that there are parts of the government that are required by law to be funded. And, and in a sense, what you're saying is, is technically true, that there are laws that say we have to pay for these entitlements. But those laws are created by government. They are enforced by government. And specifically, they are enforced by the executive branch of the government. As president, I will not enforce those laws. As president, I will shut those programs down. As president, anyone who uses Bitcoin, I'm going to pardon them. As president, anyone who refuses to pay income tax, I'm going to pardon them too. Now, if there's some way to enforce all these laws with everybody using Bitcoin, with nobody paying their taxes, or not, not their tax, nobody... You, giving into the government force that requires them to pay taxes. At that point, what you'll have is this. You'll have people who will pay for what they use. Simple example. Suppose you want to use a government school. Right now, your neighbors pay for it. 
in the future, there can still be government schools. You would just have to pay for them. No one would be forced against their will to pay for them. Uh, same thing with if you right now we're sending foreign aid, military aid to countries like Israel and Saudi Arabia and France. In right now, I say that's wrong. I don't think we should force people to do that. However, if an individual wants to voluntarily give military aid or financial aid to Israel or France or Saudi Arabia or any other country, they have that right. So I am not going to play by the rules that I disagree with morally. I am running for president to shut all that down. And I will do it either by the books, if that can be done. I'll do it against the books, if that's what, me, what it takes. I'll do it through executive order, through signing a bill into law. And if, the, if, if worse comes to worse, I'll use a, use a made up Trump style emergency, but I will shut those programs down one way or the other and cut taxes accordingly. Great. We'll move that along to Miss Kim Ruff. Thanks, Hody. I should okay, say Mrs. So- Kim Ruff now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I married myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so your question was, how would you handle taxation in the meantime until certain programs are no longer being funded or no longer in law? You're correct that there are some things that are totally beyond the scope of the federal government. Obviously, in the executive branch, that is something that is we are responsible for enforcement of existing legislation. We don't make our own legislation. So if there are laws on the books right now that make programs or insist upon us funding them a certain way, then the president can utilize that position to apply pressure to Congress to overturn those laws. That's something that you can do on the federal level. Additionally, because the executive branch is the enforcement arm of the state, of the federal government, our responsibility as a president would be to not enforce these unethical laws. So you could do things like scale massively down the executive branch to ensure that they don't have those means of using force to make these things apply. Furthermore, something that you can do is that you can stop funding state or local programs using federal money. So that's another aspect that you can do. But by and large, most of it comes down to people in their communities applying pressure on their elected representatives to put forth more leg- liberty-minded legislation and stop insisting that government be responsible for curing all that ails you. All right. I my time. You bet. <laughs> no, next up is uh, Mr. Uh, Christopher Marks. Yeah. Um, I don't think that people actually have the have a right and proper understanding about this. Government is a business. And the failure here is that taxation isn't it is your control you contributing to the overall share of maintaining a business. The failure is that the business doesn't have an ethical revenue stream. So the March 2020 administration, we're going to be fully dedicated, we're going to be fully delving into making an honest revenue stream for our governments so that the governments can pay for those services that are rightfully due to the shareholders. They're considerate dividend payments if you don't like it, if, if you don't like socialism, as a lot of people might say it is. Um, that's where we take it. That's where we're going to take and address this. We're going to give the government an honest revenue stream to finance both its representatives, its operations, its pay- employees payments, and all of its revenue, all of its needs of revenue, as well as making the dividend payments out to the people so that the people can receive the amenities and the benefits that were promised through them when they paid into maintaining this business that has no revenue stream. I yield my time. Great, let's move that along to William Hurst. I agree with most everybody else here. we definitely need to switch to to a form where people can start contributing themselves instead of being forced to pay a tax. Uh, the more wealthy can contribute a little bit more and get something in return. I don't know what to, uh, what to say they would get in return yet, but that's ultimately up to Congress and the state lawmakers, not up to the presidential the office of the president. And I do yield my time. All right, let's close it up with uh, Benjamin Letter. Um, you know, I, I feel that the essence of this question is how do, how do we as libertarians transition from the current system that we have now 
to a more voluntary system, which I think that we're all in favor of a, of a more voluntary system. Um, the best thing that, that I've seen or a, a thought that I've had uh, around in my head in relation to this is, is something that I, uh, I'm calling like the voluntary uh, tax act or voluntary taxation act. And, you know, what, what that is, is a, a system to where, I mean, we see the word GoFundMe has, has become synonymous with, uh, you know, crowdfunding. Uh, crowdfunding technology is, is available. This was talked about uh, in the 2016 election. I think I remember Gary, Gary Johnson touched, touched on it. Um, but what we need is a system of tax credits, like a, at least a dollar for dollar tax credit so that, you know, let's say, you know, you know, Hody, I think we had this conversation in our interview and you said, you know, I asked you, what would you um, uh, voluntarily contribute to in a scenario like this? And you said uh, defense. So, you know, now what we have, that, you know, from there is we have this data. We have, you know, OK, Hody donated to, you know, to defense, uh, Ben donated to, uh, let's say, something related to animals um, or science. Uh, and, and so forth. We don't need any more examples, but um, we would receive a dollar tax credit as if we had paid that, you know, full full tax there. And what that does is that that transitions us from an involuntary system to a voluntary system. And then we have data that we can take to the Congress and say, look, these programs right here receive no voluntary funding. You know what that tells us? The public doesn't support this. Maybe we should cut these programs. And I think that that data would be useful in, in telling us because like every time the budget comes around, it's a big argument. What do we cut? How much do we cut where? I think if we had this data from, you know, a voluntary taxation uh, system that we could say, well, according to this, um, these programs should be cut because nobody is contributing to them voluntarily. That may not be the full story, but at least that would be, a, I think, a valuable data point uh, when deciding uh, budget decisions. And I'll yield my time. Great. Let's move on to the next question. You've got the flat tax, the fair tax, the corporate tax, the sales tax, tariffs, and the list goes on and on. There's a lot of different models for how you make taxation. What model of taxation would you use under your administration and what rate would you think about setting it at? Once again, Daniel Berman, let's start with you. I think the best tax rate is zero. There, anything above that is theft. Um, you know, we talked about voluntary ways to do this, and of course, you know, when we we talk about um, tariffs and um, you know, income tax, sales tax, flat tax, fair tax, um, all these things, they're they're still really what's happening is you know you're threatening somebody that hey, if you don't give us money, we're going to put you in prison, we're going to shut down your business. Um, we're going to steal your property if it's an import tax, whatever the case may be, it's it's a threat. And what we need to do is, is you know, this is actually how the, the income tax was supposed to be structured. It was supposed to be for privileged income, which basically means if you're if you're somebody who's you're making your income, uh, you know, out of the country or in the country because you're a foreigner um, or you're you're making your income from the state, you're an employee of the government. This is privileged because you have now a contract with the government to enable this, this system. Now, I don't even agree with all those forms of taxes, but at least in that way, it's voluntary. You have a voluntary arrangement with the government. Hey, I'm going to work for you and you're going to take a certain percent out and use it for the defense fund. That's fine because I could say, well, I'm not going to work for you. I'm going to work for somebody else who doesn't take money out and use it for the defense fund. That's totally optional. So, but if you look at it like that way, that's not really even a tax, uh, you know, um, so, so there are all kinds of different ways to look at this. And of course they have a million different names and sometimes they say, you know, it's a user fee, it's all these other things. But the reality is if it's a tax, it's unethical, it's immoral. Um, if it's anything else, then it's voluntary, then that's fine. And we don't need to call it a tax and we can use it as a means to raise money. Um, an interesting one is the lottery. It's been said that the lottery is a tax on people who are bad at math. Well, okay, yeah, that might be true, but realistically, it's completely voluntary. People buy those tickets and some of them know the odds, some of them don't, but they buy it and they Fine. know that they're not, they're not going to, uh, their chances of winning are very small. So, but it's something they do voluntarily anyway. And that's, that's a great example. 
All right, let's move that along. Uh, Benjamin Letter, how do you feel about that? Talked about this in the last question. Uh, I would like to see us move to a, a voluntary system of taxation, something similar to uh, the way a GoFundMe works. Uh, and that the, you know, the, the money that we contribute, you know, is directly earmarked to the program that we're contributing to and that we get a direct dollar for dollar tax credit uh, for whatever uh, those of us who are a little bit more concerned with where our money is going uh, are contributing it. And the thing about the system is, is if you don't want to participate in a, in a voluntary taxation program, you don't have to. You can just, you know, do how we've been doing it, just throw it to the general fund, let, let Congress decide. Uh, but this would give uh, the people a little bit an additional check and balance on what government's doing and how it's getting funded. Uh, that's if we're going to have taxes, I think that that's the only, um, you know, I guess so-called if we're going to have an ethical way of taxation, I think that that's as close as, as we can come to with the technology we have now. Um, you know, as far as the, the tax rate, you know, if I had my choice, uh, it would be zero. Think we'd all pretty much agree on on that maybe, uh, but um, I understand that getting getting there is 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 a journey because we we do have obligations on the on the table that we need to we need to tie up all these loose ends you know um, and there's there's responsibilities we've we've written checks um, we've we've swiped the credit card we have we have debts that need to be paid these accounts need to be closed out. Uh, a lot of these programs need to be shut down. Yeah, I'll yield my time. I'll okay. Uh, our next in line is Christopher Marks. Well, off the top of my head, the first thing that I do is I get rid of income tax altogether and, uh, and go straight back to the Commerce Clause. Um, I would federally, re I would establish that the, if that, a federal legislation that it would take 50, 50 employees for you to be acting in the, within the Commerce Clause, um, so that small mom and pop shops weren't getting a weren't getting taxed so much um, as that, uh, that would be left up to the state level and get them out of the federal um, federal tax plan. The DMV, uh, which is actually what finances the Department of uh, Department of Transportation, I think that what we what I would do is I would make it to where we didn't have to actually um, pay for license plates for your vehicle. Get us back to the time uh, back to a day and age when we had the right to freely travel across our nation. Um, and then I would get rid of property tax as well. Ultimately, we've got this thing called the Fourth Amendment in the Constitution. The people are secure, it's supposed to be secure in the person's houses, papers, and effects. And I don't think that we need to have a nation where the government's constantly leasing us back our own property. Um, that's the way that I would address that. Yield my time. All right. William Hurst, what do you think? Um, as far as tax rate, we don't have much of a choice in the rate. That is, that is on Congress to decide and do their part. Uh, what we can do is pressure Congress to make changes. That is the one thing that we can do from our position. Uh, another thing we can do is help local candidates. Uh, throughout this entire race, the, that's what we can be doing, and that will help our position in the presidency, like the Democrats and the Republicans. They can pass laws because they have like-minded people in Congress. When this question comes up of what we can do from the seat of president, it is greatly affected by who we're backed by in other legis uh, the legislative branch. We do not have that backing. But maybe in the 2020 season, we can. And if we do, then we'll have an option. But as for now, we can only go with what we have. And that is of basically nothing on this question. But when we get down to it, we'll eventually be able to eventually be able to get the voluntary voluntary contributions and everything else like that up. And I yield my time. All right, let's hand that off to Kim Ruff. 
Thank you, Hody. Um, I have such grave discomfort with these questions because they are framed in such a manner and built on some core assumptions that are completely antithetical to our own belief system, which is that basically government is good and necessary, and we somehow have a duty as society to make these things happen. There is no good tax rate. There is no acceptable amount that's going to make this theft any less cumbersome to the individual. It is undeniably a violation of our negative right to property. And as Alex Mer said, our LNC vice chair once pointed out, because we invest so much of our time and our energy into creating the fruits of our labor, not only is taxation theft of property, it is also in essence murder. So to that end, I don't think that there's anything that's acceptable. I don't think that there's anything I could propose that would be slightly less worse. It's all terrible and it punishes various groups of people at different points in time. Additionally, the last question we were talking about, like there are certain government services that we can't quite get rid of. Yes, that's true. In terms of how government is structured, we can't get rid of certain things right away, but we absolutely can stop stealing from people in order to fund it. That is our role in enforcement. So I, I just, I feel like I'm picking between one form of enslavement and another, and both of them are terrible. So that's, that's all I have to say about that. I'm sorry. I love you. You're amazing, but I can't. <laughs> Well, I, I did design these after the the main the main questions that you're going to get on stage. So it's just, a lot of people don't have that assumption, but I understand. Uh, let's. I will yell at them too. Yeah, I, <laughs> I totally understand. That's how you'd respond. <laughs> uh, let's uh, let's close it up with Arvind Vora. If you go back eight years or so, eight or nine years, you can see speeches by me at Campaign for Liberty events talking about the fair tax. And the reason that I talked about the fair tax is because Gary Johnson talked about the fair, fair tax. He was somebody I looked up to. He later became our nominee. I've moved past that form of thinking. I've grown out of that. I've understood the things that Kim has been saying, a lot of other people have been saying, which is that taxation is wrong. Taxation is that. And so you ask, what is the ideal system? No taxes. It is wrong to take money without somebody's consent. Doing something to somebody without their consent is morally and ethically wrong. There's no way to make it right. Now, in terms of the mechanics, there's so many ways to do it. I mean, you could simply just pardon everyone who doesn't pay taxes, and I will happily pardon every single person who doesn't pay taxes. I'll assume anybody who does pay taxes, you know, knowing that they're guaranteed a pardon, is doing so basically voluntarily. The goal here, my goal here, is not to find some alternative way to fund big government. My goal is to defund big government. Now, Ben Letter says that we've made agreements. I don't remember making any agreement with any private prisons. I don't remember personally making any agreement with foreign countries to give them aid. I don't remember agreeing with Goldman Sachs to bail them out. That was done supposedly in my name, but without my consent. And if something's done in your name without your consent, it is not valid. Those are not valid agreements, and I will not enforce them at all. Instead, I'm going to work to make the government stop doing what it's doing. I want government to have less money. I want to starve the beast. I want government to be so small and so weak that it can't be done, that it can't do the things that it's doing. I want it to be so tiny that people, when people say, how are we gonna fund it? I can say, well, I'll just look through my couch for change and that'll be more than enough. I want to end all taxes and end what the government is doing. All right, everybody, uh, let's move on to our next question. The IRS is shown to be full of fraud and abuse. Nobody's surprised here. However, they've also proven effective at catching rich folks who attempt to dodge taxes when the season comes around. Now, do you have a plan to repeal or reform the IRS? And if so, even if you repeal it, how would this be an improvement on our revenue? We'll start with, I know you're chomping at the bit here, Kim, so let's go ahead and start with you. Oh, man, I needed a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, the IRS is terrible. It is terrible. And that is because it is the actual enforcement aspect of the taxation question. That is something that is vested under the executive branch within the Department of the Treasury. And that's something that we're going to, we have major issues with. So that they go after wealthy people doesn't somehow make them better. The fact is, is that they are using force to coerce people into giving up their justifiably earned property. So in order to mitigate that, you can pare down the department. If you don't get rid of it completely, you can absolutely pare it down to the bare bones. You can 
put pressure on Congress to overturn certain legislation that made taxes, certain taxes possible. You can additionally apply pressure on Congress to put forth legislation to get rid of the Federal Reserve. These are things that you can do in order to get rid of the involvement of, you know, our need for the enforcement arm of the state. And uh, (laughs) I know, yeah, (laughs) there's, oh God. Yeah, this is something that I, I actually have to think about more. But yes, we don't want the IRS. We want to get rid of it. We can, we should, we should try. All right. I think that about sums it up. Let's uh, let's turn that same question over to you, William Hurst. All right. I think the current government is on the path to get rid of the IRS anyways. Uh, it's underfunded. They barely have enough staff to keep up with the demand that's 300 million people, they can't keep up with it all. And they're constantly reducing that budget little by little. So I think the government's already on the path to getting rid of that. Uh, Currently, it is used more for, is used more for putting people in jail than it is for actually gaining any revenue. So ultimately, like Kim said, defunding it as much as possible. And once you do that, Congress will be forced to make a decision on how to go, uh, how to change that. They'll be forced into a position where they're going to have to change something or else for four years, there's going to be no IRS and there's going to be no way to put people in prison like they want, you know, for the different reasons that they want. So, yeah, they're going to have to come up with something else. And maybe we can drop some suggestions along the way. And I yield my time. Great. Daniel Taxation is Theft Berman. What say you? So there's a lot of uh, misconception going around about the IRS. A lot of people think if you don't pay your taxes, you're going to end up in jail. The reality is less than 1,000 people per year are prosecuted by the IRS. And most of that has to do with filing fraudulent information on your return. If you don't file your taxes, what they'll usually do is they'll file a substitute return, which that's been successfully challenged. And it turns out their process for doing substitute substitute returns was unconstitutional. Um, There's there's really a lot that's been going on with this lately. And the the IRS is much more tame now than it was just 10 or 20 years ago. So they're really already being defeated. But you can look at, uh, you know, the way that they collect is really just bullying, bullying people into paying money that they don't owe. There are people who are telling the IRS, hey, I don't this money that I earned was not taxable. And the IRS is actually striking that from the record and they're not trying to tax it. Um, You've got examples where the IRS is hiring outside agencies to collect money and they're spend they're they're paying these companies more to collect money than these companies are able to collect. So they are actually losing money by hiring collection agencies to try to collect more money. The IRS is is just a complete. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a beast of nonsense. And w- the reality is most people that give them money are not supposed to be giving them money. There's no legal obligation to give them money. And all we have to do is stop giving them money. I have a friend who's, um, who used to work at the IRS at a very high level. I'm not going to mention his name at this point, but at the very least, you know, if I don't completely shut down the IRS, I would like to put him in charge of it because he understands the constitutionality and the corruption and the intimidation tactics that the IRS uses and how exactly to get rid of them so that if anything, the only people who are paying taxes because they have a voluntary agreement with government are the only people paying taxes at all. Great. Uh, I know you're timid about this, but you're going to have to answer the question. Let's go to Arvind Vora. The first part of the question is pretty easy. I'm going to do whatever I need to to get rid of the IRS. And in the meantime, I'm just going to keep pardoning everybody who refuses to pay their taxes. I will give them preemptive pardons and shut it down that way. But the second part is a little more interesting. Why will that make our lives better? And I want you to imagine this situation. Imagine in 1900, say a farmer could produce 50 pounds of grapes. Say in 1910, he could produce 60 pounds, but the government took 10 pounds. In 1920, he could produce 70 and the government took 20 pounds and on and on because of these innovations, he could produce more and more, but the government kept taking, leaving him with what he had there. What's happened now in America is essentially that, but not just to farmers, to everybody. And the results have been absurd because the government went a little too far. They could have gotten away with shearing the sheep forever, but they tried to skin us. And so today, two parents, 
can barely provide for a family of four when one parent, when one earning parent could do that, you know, a few decades ago. Now, people are saying, well, what happened? Maybe it's automation. Automation, of course, makes us more efficient, not less efficient. Maybe it's technology. Maybe it's science. What's happening? Government has stolen from us about 100 years of the gains in productivity that come from innovation. So if you get rid of that, if you're producing five times as much and everything costs one fifth as much because everyone else is also producing five times as much, you're going to get all that. What's happening right now is all that is not just going, it's not disappearing. The money that should be building you a nice mansion is instead building somebody else an unpleasant prison. The innovation that should be going into your transportation is instead going to aircraft carriers and fighter planes. It's not disappearing. It's being squandered on things that you probably don't agree with. And so when I shut this stuff down and I defund the military welfare complex and the welfare state and the military at the prison industrial complex, that's money that's going to be coming back to you so you can use it for what you want. And listen, if you still want to spend it on the military, you Fine. can, but you'll have the right to do with it what you want to do with it. Okay, next in line, Benjamin Letter. Ben. Uh, okay, there you go. <laughs> I feel like I, I, it's the third time I keep coming back to the uh, Voluntary Taxation Act or the concept of that. Um, that's my answer to what to do about the IRS and, and how to how to move away from that. Um, I've talked about that a little bit uh, already, but I mean, just to give you know maybe a little bit more example, um, every every agency, every program would have essentially its own GoFundMe style of page, and people could contribute to it. You get a receipt, you get you know a dollar for dollar tax credit. That's that's the equivalent of, of straight up paying money in taxes. The only difference is you got to you got to choose where it went. And if that's how it worked, if that's how it actually worked, if that was the system, I'm not sure if I'd have as big a problem as I do with it, because if that would be no different than uh, you or I saying, hey, do you want to go in on this road? Our neighbor doesn't want to go in on it, but I think we should still do it, even though he doesn't want to do it. Let's do it anyway. Right. We, well, OK, we we're OK. He's not going to be mad because there's a new road. We didn't force him into it. I don't know. I would feel a lot better with a system like that. It, it, and I would be proud uh, to live in a country with a system like that and that, that operated on a system such as that. And I'll yield my time. All right. Send us home, Christopher Marks. <clears throat> you know, one of the thing, one of the most important things to me about these kinds of questions is that there are two aspects constitutionally to these questions. On the one side, there is the people's rights and interests. On the other side, there's corporate privilege and interest. Um, the IRS collecting revenue. I don't think that they should be infringing on the rights and interests of the people. The Commerce Clause, however, authorizes the government to regulate those operating within their territorial jurisdictions that are acting in the corporate privilege and interest. So I'm not a fan of big bureaucracy. I'm not a fan of inefficiency. And that's what I'm seeing here. I'm seeing that the, the Department of Treasury has this sub-corporation called the IRS doing a certain measure of its workload, creating this big, huge bureaucratic debauchery that is driving up the overall tax demand. What we do, we dissolve the IRS, we reconsolidate the aspects that are driving in the collection tax the tax collections of those who are operating in the corporate privilege and interests and leave the state, the people's rights and interests alone. I yield my time. All right. I probably should have known better than to ask a bunch of libertarians three questions about taxation, but I did it. <laughs> so let's go ahead and move away from that. The sixth largest expenditure in the United States is that of federal pensions. 
totaling over $283 billion this year alone. Social Security eclipses even that. It is our second highest expenditure at over $1 trillion this year. Yet taking away these programs would leave many retired persons without any income whatsoever. It, it also breaks the promise that we made to them many years ago. What is your plan to get control of this runaway train? And we're going to start with Arvind Vora. Let's say that agreement you're describing had been between a mafia boss and his henchmen who went around doing all kinds of immoral things. And let's say that that mafia boss told his henchmen, listen, Hody Johns is going to pay your pension. Well, you didn't agree to that. If you didn't agree to that, if you don't morally agree with what either the mafia boss or the henchmen were doing, then what you want to see is the mafia boss defunded and you don't want to see that henchman get those pen get that pension. I do not believe that people who voluntarily chose to work with an evil organization, the US federal government, should be rewarded for it. I think that if you make a deal that with something that is funded without consent, funded over people's direct objections, I don't think you should expect anything good from that. So I will not I absolutely will not in any way honor those agreements that we didn't make. If the individual congressmen want to pay out of their own pockets that money, they're welcome to do so because they're the ones who made that agreement. We did not. I don't believe in those agreements. Now, Social Security is a little bit more interesting because people are forced to pay for it, pay into it. My plan is very simple. You pay people back what they paid in and then you shut the program down. If you paid in for a year, you get a year back. If you paid in your whole life, you get that money back. If you just came from another country to the United States when you're 85, you get absolutely nothing. The Supplement Security Income Program, that needs to go, and I'm gonna shut that down as quickly as I possibly can. How do we fund that? Well, the government has been trying to pay off federal pensions by selling off government land. I think that would be a really good way to, instead of you wasting on federal pensions, Use that to pay back Social Security. This is not a new idea. This is Harry Brown's idea. It was right then, and it's even more right now. Shut it down, sell off land, and pay people back what they paid it. All right, next up, Kim Ruff. Okay. <clears throat> I am absolutely in agreement with Arvind Vora. And even though I've been instructed by my husband not to agree with other people, I'm doing it anyway because he's right on the money. <laughs> It is absolutely correct. When it comes to things like federal pensions and other things that people have been promised by being government employees in some way, shape or form, that is a covenant that they came into with government and it was already done coercively. And you're absolutely right. We should not be on the hook for that. With respect to Social Security, we have that portion of our money taken out of our check. We don't have a choice in the matter and we should absolutely have it reimbursed on a one to one ratio and the program must end. Because the existence of the program creates what's called a moral hazard, which is effectively we look to government to guarantee our retirement or we look to the governmental institution to promise us and make it whole, make it do on this. In so doing, we don't make intelligent decisions for our own retirement. We don't take the onus on ourselves to plan for our retirement. We think, well, we'll get Social Security, so why should I bother? When you take the responsibility out of the individual's hands or the consumer's hands, then they end up engaging in riskier behavior. In the case of some moral hazards, like you talk about people who have really nice cars and they think I've got all this insurance, I'm going to drive really badly and I'll be fine because I have all this insurance and I drive this really fancy car. Well, they're more likely to get in accidents, more likely to get injured. In the case of government backing finances, government saying we'll cover your retirement, people are more likely to engage in riskier financial decisions thinking they've got this golden parachute of government intervention. If we don't have government there, we don't have this illusion of security or safety or retirement, then people will be a hell of a lot more inclined to take responsibility for themselves and make better financial decisions. So that's absolutely something that we need to end. All right, William Hurst, what do you think? Uh, with Social Security, the idea started off in a good way. They wanted to take care of people. Okay. I can somewhat agree with that, but it was a system set up for failure. There is no way, there is no way to continuously fund that unless our population is consistently growing. We will eventually hit a peak. Now we're starting to slow down now, but we'll eventually hit a peak where we don't 
have more population contributing in than we have people taking out of that. Well, with people taking out of that, it doesn't just include the people who need it. It includes the politicians using the funding that people are paying into Social Security to pay for pet projects. We already don't have enough money for pet projects, so they're withdrawing it from Social Security. It's a failing plan. And while instead of letting it just fail on its own, we can set it up, set it up to where people can change over and get off of Social Security and slowly wean, wean the public off of Social Security. And as we still slowly start weaning people off of the Social Security plan, we start reducing the amount paid in. And I yield my time. Okay. Next up, Christopher Marks. Okay. Government employees, you're a public servant. You should only get paid while you're doing your job. And after you're done doing your job, you should go back into the private work, uh, the private um, corporate workforce or as a self-employed individual. Stop it. Stop it at the, your last day of office. I personally I, I have personally have drifted, drafted up an executive order that I plan on initiating on day one of the March 2020 administration, where I'm going to make a, I'm going to take a $300,000 a year pay cut. Um, I will not be receiving any benefits or wages after my last day of office. Um, 24 hours a day, 365 for a four year time period, making 100,000 a year versus 400,000 a year. I think that's pretty good. And I'm gonna kind of use the bully pulpit to, uh, to force that down the people, uh, force that uh, down the Congress and the Senate's throat as well. Now, we'll go ahead and set that aside. When we're talking about social security, this is something that I'm very, very passionate about. Less than $30 billion a year are paid out to the individual trustors, you, the people who have contributed to the social security funds, and over $50 billion a year is paid out to the state governments to commit crimes against you in the family court system, as well as in the criminal court system. And that is a massive fiscal mismanagement of your trust funds, ladies and gentlemen. We're gonna go ahead and put an immediate stop to that, and that's going to make it to where the social security system becomes fiscally solvent again. Because I'm not a sociopath. I'm not going to leave our elderly, disabled, and disenfranchised that don't have this amazing support group out there to sustain them. And I don't want to be Christopher Marks, the guy that has people dying in the gutters. All right. Uh, ben Letter, what say you? Well, I guess that's, that's part of the heart of the issue. Um, once again, you know, first off, um, what kind of a pension program? It goes so unfunded. Um, this money was taken from people, and it looks like it's been either mismanaged or possibly stolen. Um, and that should be that should be in, in investigated to see if there are any improprieties uh, going on there. And possibly some people should be prosecuted behind this because a, a large theft and, and scam has been perpetrated uh, on the American people with, with these plans that, you know, social security essentially being a Ponzi scheme. Um, now the thing is, is um, I think it would be uh, unethical. It'd be a really bad thing for us to do uh, to say, okay, this was a bad deal, but the, the people whose pensions that, that those are that worked for them and all that, just to say you're screwed. Um, if we were the investors of the company and our employees had a pension plan, I mean, would, would we do that? Would we leave them hanging? Um, I think we need to clean it up. Now we can we can stop doing things this way. Um, but as far as past mistakes, we have to be responsible for past mistakes. Um, it's not right to take someone one's pension away that they were under the belief that they they were working for and they thought it was legitimate and you know 
we put those or our parents or whoever put those people in office and made those laws. Yeah, we got to undo it now, but we can't just say you're screwed. So I, I do think that there's a, a need to, to pay out liabilities, put freezes on new ones, not repeat the same mistakes. Uh, but we got we to gotta take care of our debts. Um, we don't have to rack up right. new ones and, and possibly, uh, you know, a, a, a program or it could be on a, you know, a voluntarily, hey, do you want to help pay this down? You can voluntarily contribute to it. I'd be curious to see how many people would voluntarily contribute to something like some of these pensions uh, and mm -hmm. social security and so forth. All right. Uh, iron this out for us. You get the closing words. Daniel, taxation is that Berman. So I'm hearing a lot of really interesting comments. Um, you know, it's true. This, the social security is a Ponzi scheme. It's true that uh, these pensions are a fraud. They're promising money that they don't have. Um, but, you know, it's also, it's also true that, you know, these people voluntarily took these agreements that, hey, I'm going to work for this organization and I'm going to get paid. But at the same time, they didn't really look at this organization as a criminal organization. So um, to, to Arvin's analogy, yes, if you said I'm going to work for the mafia and then the mafia heads go to jail and now there's no income to, to pay your pension, yes, some people are going to get screwed. But what if those people working for the mafia didn't know they were working for the mafia? Or let's say they were working for a corporation and the corporation goes bankrupt. It, it, let's say it is a legitimate organization. This is something that happens all the time. And in something like that, you usually have some sort of bankruptcy proceeding. If there's criminal involved, some people would be prosecuted and, and their money would be taken to pay off um, the, the people affected, the victims of their crimes. And we really have to look at it like this. The people who have invested in these really bad financial instruments and these financial products and financial systems, they're victims of this. And we need to understand that. And, and you know, we can, through a little bit of... of um, you know, creative processes, we can figure out how to make sure that these people aren't completely screwed over. They might not get everything that they were promised, but, you know, uh, we, we don't want to leave them to, to die in the gutter. Um, we do want to make sure that, hey, there are assets that can, that can protect this. There are ways that we can transition you into other programs. So maybe we can make Social Security, um, whether it's privatized or voluntary or whatever that system is, and let people start opting out of it. Maybe we can let them spend spend and invest their money more um, uh, uh, better, so that so that you know it's not such a, a hole in a bucket that everyone's just throwing money into, and that people have a way out of the system without just being left with absolutely nothing. And I think that's the solution we need to start looking at. Okay, great. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, I debated putting this one in here because it might be too complex, but I decided that you guys were smart enough, so don't make me look bad. Something you as president will be able to control is the amount of currency in circulation, both in minted paper and metal, uh, metal and uh, electronically. Uh, experts in both Keynesian and Austrian economic schools agree that this monetary quantity impacts the economy more than any other single aspect, including taxation. How would you distribute money as value is added to America and by its institutions? Benjamin Letter, we'll start with you. You're muted, my friend. As usual. Um, I didn't realize the president had that much leeway. I thought the Federal Reserve uh, was responsible for issuing out the, the currency and, and deciding the, uh, the rate there. The president does nominate the, uh, the head of the Federal Reserve. But uh, I think there's a little, I don't know, uh, if things actually work that way. But uh, I, like some of the other people here, uh, am not a big fan of the Federal Reserve and, and the way that that uh, operates. Um, I've considered uh, as of late moving um, in, a, in a different direction. We say in the Fed, I've got a sign back here that says in the Fed, but we never really talk about what to do next. So I've been trying to come up with some kind of idea. So we still have the U.S. Mint that was formed like in the 1790s. Uh, and it's not subjected to the same rules as the Federal Reserve, not the same system. So, you know, 
theoretically here, I would think that the mint could be expanded. The mint could uh, get into some, some type of cryptocurrency um, and that we could we could do things differently and get out of the the fractional reserve method where we're, we're constantly, uh, you know, introducing more and more and more currency into circulation, therefore reducing the value of the currency and, and ending up with less and less purchasing power year after year. Uh, I think we could get rid of the Fed. I think we could get rid of the Fed quickly. And I think that we could transition with the, over to the, uh, the U.S. Mint being right there, still always been there, and switch over. Most of our transactions are digital now anyway. We can easily switch to a, a, a some type of cryptocurrency being coined via the Mint that could you know switch over to our, our dollar and not work on the same system, therefore you know inflating it quite the same way. Um, I'll yield my time. All right, Daniel Berman, all you. So uh, this is a really interesting question. And if you look at the way that the money supply works, um, you know, we have the actual amount of, of printed money that's in circulation, that's deposited, relent, relent. Um, and the Federal Reserve is keeping track of all this. So they know, they know, you know, what the actual aggregated money supply is. Um, and they used to publish that in the M3 report, which after the financial crisis, they stopped uh, publishing because they don't want to know how much money's in circulation. But the, the reality is, you know, we talk about this complicated system of a central reserve bank that's issuing money and then all these other banks that are issuing that are creating new money um, with fractional reserve lending. What we can actually do is as we as we increase the reserve rate and, and we require the banks to hold more money, we can actually substitute that with the actual money that's in circulation so we can keep the M3, the amount of money that's actually in circulation. We can keep that stable. So we're not creating more inflation or deflation by the currency. Now, something else we have to understand that's a little bit more complicated is prices are always going to fluctuate. We think about if prices go up, that's inflation. If prices go down, that's deflation. But the reality is everything floats in its own direction. If we're able to produce corn uh, more efficiently, then the price of corn is going to go down. And that's not deflation. Inflation, deflation more specifically relate to the actual um, inflation and deflation of the currency, printing more or, or shrinking the money supply. And if we can stabilize that money supply um, so, that, so that we do have a system that's, that's, you know, uh, that's stable so we can get rid of the Federal Reserve, and then once we're on that, we can start um, shifting towards um, actual competitive currencies and allow those competitive currencies to inflate or deflate based on the amount of gold that they can put in their reserves or the number of Bitcoins that are in circulation. Um, allow that naturally. But the, the most evil thing about inflation and deflation is not that it occurs. It's that a few people sitting in a boardroom have the have the ability to control the money supply and inflate and deflate however they want just by saying, hey, let's print some more money or let's stop lending. OK, William Hurst, why don't you top that? Well, I'm going to have to pass on it because I was doing the responsible citizen thing. I don't know if y'all saw it behind me, but uh, there was a pretty decent accident. And being a former medic, I ran to the uh, ran to the issue. So I completely missed it. I was on the phone with the police, and I guess I'll yield my time on that one. You know what? I will go ahead, and for you, my good citizen, I will repeat the question. Something you as president will be able to control is the amount of currency in circulation, both in minted paper and metal form and electronically. Experts in both Keynesian and Austrian economic schools agree that this monetary quantity impacts the economy more than any other single aspect, including taxation. How would you distribute money as value is added to the system? Mm. Uh, well, as we get money, the more money we put into circulation, the the higher, the higher we inflate interest. Uh, and as we do so, people actually lose money if they've saved money uh, because their money is now worth less. I'm working on a, I'm working on a system that I can't exactly talk about yet uh, that will change the way, you know, it'll get rid of the Fed, but it will change the way we see money itself. And we'll be able to include other forms of monetary contribution or monetary exchange between one person and the next while being able to handle some of the federal debts, including money into the system in a way that's actually responsible. Now, I can't go 
full into that because it's not completely worked out yet. Uh, when I do, I'll make sure y'all know. <laughs> Thank you, and I'll yield my time. All right. Kim Ruff, can you beat the super secret plan? <laughs> I know. I'm like, I was giving a puppy CPR and <laughs> like, I'm never going to be as good as him. All right. <laughs> okay. Actually, Dan did a really beautiful job. And obviously this is a strong suit. Like he really understands monetary policy and economics. And that's totally awesome. So just to sort of add to what he already kind of laid out, something that we need to consider is that since the Federal Reserve was first established in 1913, the value of the dollar has gone down 95%. So you're effectively getting a nickel worth for that original dollar amount. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that how we actually fund government programs. People think that what it is is a one-to-one -one ratio, which is we propose this government program, and then we are going to take that commensurate amount from the taxpayer to fund it. But that's not actually how it works. We propose a project and then we go to the Federal Reserve and say, would you give us X amount of dollar loan at whatever set interest rate that lasts however long so that we can fund this pet project and then we'll put the taxpayer on the hook for paying it off. So the Federal Reserve prints off all these dollars. They end up creating inflation, as Dan talked about, which is where there's an, a glut of dollars and like anything in the economy, when there's an excess of the value decreases. So when it comes time for the taxpayer to pay that, they have less value to their dollar to pay off that loan. And that ends up ultimately hurting the economy. So yes, what we can do is stabilize what our money supply is to ensure that we don't have inflation or deflation, that we have it held steady at a certain value. And you don't do that artificially. You do that by not tampering with it. On top of it, we can veto any legislation that requires additional spending, proposes these pet projects, like not funding the wall is a really good way to help the economy because we're not taking another loan from the Federal Reserve and thus increasing inflation. So there's a lot of stuff that we can actually do that doesn't involve us tampering. It just involves us stepping back and allowing the free market to go through its natural ebbs and flows. That is how we can make the economy stronger. Great. Next up, Arvin Vora. Both Adam Smith and Karl Marx agree that the purpose, one of the main purposes of currency is to allow you to trade your labor for somebody else's labor. An hour of your labor should buy about an hour of somebody else's labor. If one of your labors is very difficult, requires a lot of education, or is very rare, it's going to be adjusted accordingly. But today, an hour of your labor is being cut down by taxes. The hour, of the, other per, the hour of the other person's labor is also being cut down by taxes. You're basically getting a fourth. Your purchase power, purchasing power is being cut down by a fourth. Now we can address this monetarily and it's actually not as intense and, and incendiary as, as most of the things that I propose. This requires changing what's called a legal tender law. Today there are laws that say you have to accept Federal Reserve notes and that you are not allowed to create a competing currency. You guys might have seen that the person who minted Ron Paul silver coins was arrested. And many people who try to mint their own currency immediately get arrested. And that lets us know that what they're doing is the right thing. That's what's damaging to government. This is not something where we actually need to shut anything down. We don't need to abolish the Fed. We can let it keep on doing its thing as long as we allow fair competition. If someone says, listen, this is a non-inflationary currency. Try it out. It's silverback. Somebody else might say, well, I have this, this thing called Bitcoin. It has all these other advantages. Somebody else might say, well, I have this thing called Dash. And it's kind of like Bitcoin, but it has these other advantages. And we just let those currencies compete. People will, as in competition always happens, choose what works for them. And that might be a situation where everybody says, well, this is the best thing. That sometimes happens in competition. Or different people might choose different things. Some people might say, I like this for this reason. Other people might say, I like this for this other reason. But whatever they choose, it's probably going to be much better than whatever the Federal Reserve is promising. Competition is going to end the Federal Reserve. If I'm president, I'm going to end legal tender laws using the power of pardon. Great. Uh, our closer will be Christopher Marks on this question. Article 1, Section 8 is the United States exclusive 
uh, exclusive privilege to print for a uh, print a national currency. Somehow, somewhere along the lines, our go- federal government said we're going to outsource and privatize this exclusive privilege that we have the con- that we uh, this exclusive constitutional privilege to a private bank called the Federal Reserve. JFK. Um, a signed executive order 11110 um, and started minting uh, silver certificates. Um, shortly after there, he uh, had a mishap. Um, I have spoken ex- extensively in regard to making a honest revenue stream for our governments. That revenue stream is based in renewable resource economics. Um, I want our government to invest its time, its efforts into producing renewable resource electricity. And based off, domestically based off of how much they can produce a renewable resource electricity will allow it will make a new form of currency a, a article one section eight form of currency from there uh i want i want i want to explore the option of using a making a national cryptocurrency in this regard and then I would like to make it to where we end our relationship with the Federal Reserve, because when they provide, as people have said before, when they provide ask for that loan from the Federal Reserve, what they do is they say, we have X number of people in the United States, and we can essentially create X number of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, of worth of debt for that individual. And that debt is how, based off of money mechanics, how they base our national dollar domestically. I want to base our national dollar system domestically on how much renewable resource electricity we can produce. This will make it to where we can sell electricity cheaply to those uh, businesses that are acting through the Commerce Clause which will make them want to come to the United States to do business. And then we can tax those businesses accordingly through the Commerce Clause. This will make it to where we have a fiscally solvent economic system in the United States. All right. Well, now that we've got you all locked into your answers on monetary distribution, let's talk about the most popular form of monetary distribution. Universal basic income is growing in popularity. Right now, Americans see new money going straight to central banks, political affiliates, and corporate sponsors while they work and hope enough trickles down to them. Is this gripe misguided or is this complaint unfair? What are your general thoughts regarding universal basic income? Let's start with Ben Letter. You're muted again, buddy. Yeah, oh, yeah. It takes me a second. Um, you know, I, 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 I knew you were going to bring up the UBI thing, and I thought, I thought I don't do much, really any preparation for these things, but I, I did have a thought about this since I knew you were going to be talking about UBI. I've never seen UBI pull a country out of a bad situation economically. I've never seen. Uh, a, a country that was, you know, we could use the term third world, elevate itself because of UBI. Um, I've never seen that happen. I've never seen these, these benefits, these economic benefits, these grand economic benefits that some people claim. Um, and I sh- I'm sure a thousand dollars a month uh, sounds good to everybody. Um, but that money's got to come from somewhere. I mean, I don't think anybody's really that dumb to realize that that money doesn't come from somewhere. And it's just basically, hey, let me take the money out of your left pocket and I'm gonna put it in your right pocket, it's your money. Um, And like I said, my big point there is is, is when I see a a country or a state or any jurisdiction thereof on, on planet earth uplift itself economically via UBI, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start to take it seriously. Until then, I'll yield my time. All right, uh, Christopher Marks. Let's have your your thoughts on this. 
Speaking of UBI is grabbing Tinkerbell by her wings and spanking her and getting hope fairy dust um, and making it the government making you a promise that they will resolve your problem, all of your financial problems with it, problems with a thousand dollars a month. It's garbage. What we really need to do is we need to get control of our two party system. I've said this before and I will keep restating this. The Democrats party platform is to constantly push up on the tax burden upon the overall tax base. The Republican Party constantly pushes down on those who are involved in the Commerce Clause, the corporate privilege and interest, and their contribution to the overall tax base. And then what they do together in unison, working together against you, the people, the constituents who vote them into office is displace the overwhelming burden upon you, financially devastating you. What we can do is we can shrink our government, leveling, lowering down the overall tax burden upon the people. Uh, the overall tax base. We can get the Republicans to let up on how much they're pushing down on the overall tax contribution by corporate privilege and interest. And as such, then your taxes go down. The amount of money you have in your pocket at the end of the day goes up. You have become more financially prosperous, and this is going to be significantly better than any promise of a thousand dollars free every month i yield the rest of my time okay let's move it along to arvin vora i get why people like the idea you see all these people getting millions of dollars of stolen tax money you know i live in dc i see federal contractors who do nothing useful living in huge mansions i get why you want to do that but we can be better than that when you see a criminal action going on, there's two options. If you see somebody getting away with something immoral, you can say, let me stop that person. Or you can say, let me do the same as that person. We can be the people that say, let me stop that. And like you, I think it's wrong for corporations to be taking your money. I think it's wrong for government contractors to do literally nothing useful to be taking your money. But the right answer is not to be the same as them. UBI is just a way to get you to buy into the federal government so that you become dependent on that. But let me tell you something. You can do better than that. Listen, you worked hard. Many of you have gone to college. You're, you're, you've, you've shown that you can work hard. Many of you have started businesses. Many of you have jobs. You show up to that. You can do better than just $1,000 of scrap a month. Because I'll tell you one thing. After the government is done with that, it's going to be just a way to get more money to their political cronies. And you don't want to be somebody else's political crony. You don't want to be just another welfare recipient. UBI is just universal welfare. And you people don't come to America. You didn't work hard all of your life so that you could just be a welfare recipient. My plan is different. It's to stop taking your money and giving it to people who didn't earn it. If you work hard, if you labor, you're going to be able to trade your labor through a proper currency for somebody else's labor. If you keep working hard, you're going to get what is rightly yours. And people who don't work hard, well, the great thing is this. My program is going to give them every incentive to work hard. UBI, in addition to being a bad idea, takes away people's incentives to work. And so now, not only are we doing something immoral, we are sapping productivity incentives. It's a bad idea. We need to end the welfare state, not grow it. If I'm elected, I'm going to end the welfare state and end the income tax. All right, Daniel Taxation is that Berman. What do you think? Free money. Where do I sign up? <laughs> so uh, there's, I, I don't have enough time to put all my thoughts out on this, but um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things you brought up. There's the trickle down economics, which a lot of people say don't work. Um, I think it actually does work. The problem is the money goes all the way down, and then we're stupid enough to hand that money back to the big corporations, the people at the top, on a silver platter. We do it. Every Thanksgiving on Black Friday, we spend hundreds of dollars on tennis shoes that cost $5 to make. We spend thousands of dollars on, on a new phone when our old one works perfectly well. We spend money like stupid, and that's how all these people are getting all this money. Now, the concept of universal basic income 
the idea is to supplement your cost of living, but the reality is the people living in rural Texas have a completely different cost of living than someone in Los Angeles or New York or Seattle. So the next thing you know, everyone's going to be complaining, well, how come they get a thousand when I live here and my rent's so high, I should be getting 5,000. And the next thing you know, this thing's just going to spiral out of control. It's completely idiotic. Now there's one thing I'm going to try to fit in if I can. Um, people say, hey, uh, there aren't going to be any jobs because everything's going to be replaced by automation. That's a complete farce. The reality is if you're not giving money out to people, the prices are going to drop like crazy. Imagine a corporation that puts a factory right next to a mine that has all the ores it needs to make to make cell phones. It's going to produce a million cell phones a minute because it doesn't have to have any employees. It pulls the metal out of the ground and poof, it turns it into a phone. Guess what? Those phones are going to cost a penny each and you don't need a job to get it. That's That's the reality of what we're going to with automation. Okay. Uh, William Hurst, what do you say? Well, UBI, by Yang's idea, would cost $3.6 trillion a year. Uh, and Harris's idea on it would cost $1.8 trillion a year. Our last question, we talked, or a couple of us talked about inflation. If we introduced all of that money into our system, our inflation would be through the roof. Our dollar would mean nothing anymore. And the only way to counter that inflation is sprinkle some fairy dust on it. And we can't be sprinkling fairy dust on it by taxation. Uh, you Hello? I feel like everything just froze. automation and human labor becoming less uh, less valuable than automated systems we will eventually run into that topic but today is not that day and when that topic comes around we will have a better understanding of where the public stands different creations people have made to come up with income in the face of automation that is not happening or that is currently happening on small scale now. As more companies move to automation, more people will start to come up with new ideas for their own income, like what we're doing right now, podcasts. That is a way that can't be automated unless you, Hody, are a machine somehow. I've heard about that before. Anyway, I will yield my time. And I am a podcasting machine. Uh, <laughs> let's go ahead and close it off with Kim Ruff. Okay. Universal basic income for politicians is just the modern day equivalent of a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. It's government promising you something for nothing. It has no means of being funded. Nobody ever discusses where this magical box of money comes from, just that you will get it and that presumably you will have a lot more economic opportunity. But what's forgotten here is that when you raise the base up, when you say our new zero is $1,000 a month or whatever we're going to set it at, you effectively raise everything up, which is to say that the cost of goods and services goes up, housing goes up, medical care goes up. So it's not like you're going to have more opportunity because you suddenly have this magical box of money to buy more with your goods and services. Additionally, look at the government. It has a huge debt and runs a deficit. Do you truly trust the government to make wise financial decisions for you? And yet here we are every election cycle looking to the government to give us more when they clearly can't even handle what they do. So as far as automation goes and that argument, then find a different industry. That's an opportunity for people to pivot. That's what we say always in the free market system, pivot or die. If you are no longer viable in whatever industry you're in, get more education, learn a trade, Try something new. The internet is full of YouTube videos that will teach you how to be a better person and learn new skills. Pivot or die. It's not our job to bail you out any more than it is our job to bail out the banks. All right, guys. Great. I didn't even know we'd get an automation there. You guys are fantastic. Uh, all right. Let's move on. Next question here. Medicare and Medicaid are by far our largest expenses. It's $1.1 trillion a year, and it's growing big time. While we hypothetically could pay less than that, 
even nothing, towards it, we currently have forced doctors to do over $30 trillion in medical procedures that they have not yet been compensated for. How do we responsibly pay off this debt to these medical professionals who we forced to do work for us, or do we simply say, we lied too bad? And we are going to start with William Hurst. I do believe we covered this question before uh in our medical medicare thing maybe almost exactly this question <laughs> uh now we we do have the responsibility to pay people back for their work if we promised it it is our responsibility and we can make deals with them uh to reduce the amount that needs to be paid but we can't just cut everybody off uh, and you talked about reducing the cost of medical medical coverage as it stands. And yes, that is very much possible. Uh, I don't have the stats in front of me from the last the last debate that we had, but a large a large chunk of the medical industry is billing. So finding the money it takes I think it was like twenty percent of the the amount, the, the the cost that people pay into healthcare is just billing and coding. So if we, well, we can't, but if other people work towards changing that part of the system, it'll be a lot cheaper, significantly cheaper. A Band-Aid will no longer cost $800 in a hospital. And I yield my time. All right, great. Daniel, taxation is theft, Berman. So healthcare is an interesting one. Um, you know, the, the prices that we have are so inflated for so many reasons. Um, and again, this is just more debt that the government's taken on promising to pay people later. Um, there, you know, we have to transition to a system where we're getting people healthcare that they can actually afford uh, without all this government bureaucracy in it. And as we do that, people are going to be able to get what they need. And these, these, uh, the big pharma companies aren't going to be making all these massive profits. All these other corporations like hospitals that have, you know, they're, they're taking advantage of us and saying, hey, you're sick. Oh, well, if you want to live, give us everything you got. That's not going to happen anymore. Um, and as we do that, you know, there, uh, yeah, there's, uh, you know, there are doctors who, who might be owed some money. Well, think about it like this. The government's giving you money. Uh, they're handing it to you with one hand and then with their other hand, they're taking money out of your back pocket. What if they stop taking money out of their back pocket? What's that going to cancel out? Um, we have to take this all into consideration. So I think there's, there's a much bigger problem than this. This is just some of the debt that, that, um, you know, government is owed. And, you know, we have to look at what's, you know, how is this, how is this going to affect the market as a whole? There are going to be a lot more doctors who are going to be able to perform more procedures without, uh, increasing this debt. And, you know, there are a lot of people who get screwed all over the place all the time. They're owed money and they don't get paid it. And especially when you're pro made promises by people who have no intention of ever paying you back or because they're not on the line, it's, it's very unfortunate. Um, you know, nobody wants to get stuck uh, being owed money and not being able to collect on it. But at the same time, if that's not, you know, if, you know, these doctors hopefully are not in a position where if we don't pay them the money that they're owed, they're, they're not going to starve. And I don't think that's the case if they're continuing to operate, then we shouldn't look at that maybe as the, as the first priority of debts that need to be paid off. But we do need to figure something out so that people get screwed the least amount possible and pay off, you know, the legitimate debts as much as we can. And, you know, we've got to figure out a way to, to make that work to transition to a system where this just doesn't happen. Okay. Ben Letter. I'm assuming that at some point, you know, there was a group of guys that were sitting around who were like, hey, how can we turn healthcare into a Ponzi scheme? And here we are. Um, we don't have to screw people over, even though these programs should be ended. You know, um, we can we can we can close them out. It's possible to, to close out programs not take on new business or not not take on new people freeze these programs out and pay pay off what's what's owed and and not make more promises that we can't keep 
we got to get out of the business of making promises that we we, we shouldn't be making. Um, and I think that's the probably the biggest benefit to the potential of a, of a libertarian administration is I think all of us want to get out of the business of making promises that we either shouldn't be making or flat out can't keep. Um, that being said, I'm not a fan of either one of those programs. I understand they're meant to be a solution. I just don't think that they're a good or effective solution. They're old, outdated, and they're full of unsatisfied people. I don't hear a lot of people, uh, or really anybody for that matter, uh, running around saying how satisfied, how satisfied they are with either one of those programs. So with that, I'll yield my time. Okay, Christopher Marks. Well, uh, thanks to our previous conversation, I am a advocate for uh, ending the Federal Drug Administration, uh, privatizing, uh, allowing uh, certain private companies to do that. Maybe we'll offer, it will um, provide some federal oversight to ensure that they're maintaining national compliance uh, standards. Second, Get rid of mandatory uh, mandatory malpractice insurance for medical health care providers. Instead, substitute in a trust fund contribution to a max uh, to a certain amount based off of their annual um, number of services provided. Um, that will also get them a little bit of a bump back from contributing to this trust fund. Uh, this will overall lower the cost of medical uh, healthcare procedures altogether. Um, get ridding, getting rid of third-party administrators, which cause further financial burden upon healthcare providers, which drives up their costs as well. And then overall, when health in, when health coverage or healthcare um, services being provided becomes more fiscally a, a fiscally available to the common American individual, then we don't we can open a then there will be a a, a unnecessary for health insurance um, and certainly not mandate it uh, for all American people to utilize and making and make that open market become competitive again. Currently, we have a situation. Where the government had said you have to have health insurance and the insurance companies said yay mandatory consumers we're gonna push up our costs okay. which is what government's good at all right what do you think kim ruff it's so interesting when we get asked questions like this and it, it's really good prep work for us when we go onto a national stage because initially yeah <laughs> dad love you hody no, it's, it was fascinating about it is for a brief moment when you do ask these questions, I take pause like, hmm, what would I do about those things? And then I'm like, wait a minute. Here we are once again being suckered into saying, what can government do for us? In every single situation, every single person, subgroup, community, business, individual, foreign nation at some point in time has been done dirty by government. At some point in time, they've been victimized by bad government policies. When are we going to stop the cycle of abuse? How about we just stop it full stop and stop trying to use government to cure all that ails us? We cannot make everybody whole. We already are saddled with huge unfunded liabilities in the form of $22 trillion in debt. And we have that burden to carry. If unless we get really lucky and people say, never mind about that, forget it, we're cool. Why are we going to continue to add to this problem by taking more money from the people and redistributing it to make somebody else feel better? Can't we just say we were wrong? Government is wrong. Look to the free market and your community to aid you. If it's truly important to you to make other people whole, like say somebody gets out of prison and they were put there wrongly, then start a collection in your community, your neighborhood to help support and sponsor that individual. Stop using a mechanism of force to compel action. That's it continues the problem. All right, Arvin, she she said bad things about your FDA, my friend, but you're going to have to respond to that. Let's talk about what the choice is that people face. I work in education. I live in inside the Beltway. 
And my company, we choose not to take any government contracts, not to take any military contracts. And it's not for financial reasons, because most of these contracts are a million plus dollars per phase, which is more, much more than I make a year. Uh, we make that as a, as a moral choice. And many doctors make the same moral choice. They choose not to accept Medicaid. They choose not to accept Medi-Cal in California. They choose not to accept Medicare. You actually have to actively choose to accept those things. The doctors that choose not to, I say, let them be right. Let them be rewarded. You know, back during the day that during the Wall Street bailout, I said the same thing. Let the banks, the small banks who refuse to get to make these mistakes, let them be rewarded for making the right decision. And I say, let the doctors who don't take Medicare, who don't take Medicaid be rewarded. The result of that in the, in the short term is gonna be more and more doctors are gonna opt out of that. And also other people in other industries will say, wait, maybe these government contracts really aren't quite as secure as we thought. You know, today many doctors have even stopped taking insurance for both financial and moral reasons. Those types of decisions should be rewarded. We shouldn't reward people who make the wrong decision, who get involved with government when you don't have to. As a doctor, you do not have to take Medicare or Medicaid and many doctors don't. But let's talk about how do we, I wanna get rid of Medicare and Medicaid, I've made that pretty clear, but how do we pay for it? Check, listen, listen to this aspect. If we get rid of the FDA, if we allow the best doctors in Switzerland and Germany and Japan to practice medicine over here, to stop those ridiculous laws that prevent that, if we get rid of the laws that say you cannot buy medicines from overseas, medical costs will be so low that anybody will, can afford them. We don't need Medicare and Medicaid. We need to get the government out of driving up the price of medicine, and we need to stop rewarding people who join government. All right, two minutes on the button. All right, candidates, we promised some open forum time to everybody. I do have a couple other questions here, but you know what? Instead of just asking them straight up as questions, I'm just going to pose them and let you banter back and forth because uh, we got some great interactions from the community, but not really any direct questions. Uh, a few jokesters over here asking which one of you will end the Fed first, uh, which I'm He'll sure- fight you for it. Yeah, <laughs> it'll be a, a, a fight to the back ra bat rack for that one. But um, let's talk about, let's just talk about federal unions real quick. And uh, any order, if you don't want to talk about it, you don't have to, but just go ahead. I'm sorry, you said you want to talk about federal unions? Yeah, federal unions. Like them, don't okay. like them. We got the taxpayer or the constitution, which says you're allowed to unionize, but you also work for a government monopoly, and it's kind of taxpayer money. Just navigate that stream for us if you want. I thought you were talking about the North here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't mind starting off this one. I mean, my position is clear. You shouldn't have any federal workers. And the federal workers that are there should not be allowed to unionize. It is morally wrong to have a bunch of people unionize against the American people. On one side, you have taxpayers. On the other side, you have people who are stealing tax money or having the government steal it for them so they can do something damaging. I don't think we should make that any easier. Now, the solution is not to block unionization per se. It's to fire federal workers by shutting down federal agencies. That is something that I'm going to do about as soon as I possibly can. Is that before or after you end the Federal Reserve? I actually don't even have a direct plan. I'm, I, I want to end the Federal Reserve through competition, Kim. In other <laughs> words, I don't actually need to end the Fed. I just need to legalize Bitcoin and all other forms of currency, and people will just stop using the Fed because it's going to lose the competition. I want to talk about that, actually, because the, the, like here's the weird thing about the Fed, right? The U.S. government has a mint, and that mint has the printing press that prints the money. They pay for the ink. They pay for the employees. They pay for the paper or cotton. They own the property that it's on. And somehow, when they print money, it's called borrowing. It makes absolutely no sense. It's a messed up game of three-card Monty. If you get rid of the Federal Reserve and say, hey, we owe you money, but we're not going to pay it back, we're going to take over the process of printing, which at this point really should be mostly destroying the old bills and printing new ones. The Federal Reserve is gone, and there's no process to it, and that's it. It's gone. It's done, and that's it's as simple as that. Sovereignty. I'm some money right now. <laughs> Sovereignty in its, in its own nature. One of the things you covered there about all the the money, it costs money to print money. So the penny itself is 1.7 cents to create every penny. So we lose money for creating those. Yeah, in most other countries, I know everyone's really attached to the penny, but I've been to a lot of other countries and, you know, the uh, in Mexico, 
Um, the the smallest bill is a is a twenty is twenty pesos, which is about a dollar. So that's about what we have here. But their smallest coin is is one peso, which is about five cents. So it's kind of like a nickel. Um, you know, this idea of print of making coins that cost more to produce is completely idiotic. Just get rid of them. You guys are assassinating Lincoln twice. <laughs> oh, come on. Stick him, stick him on a new 15 cent coin. <laughs> Nobody, nobody's using coins anymore. Who's carrying I would say just undo it. Right I'm sorry, go ahead. Me. <laughs> you prove it, Kim. Pull out some change. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't, I don't, that's a really good point, too. A lot of. <laughs> A lot of countries are, you know, um, I, I recently went to Australia and most of their prices, especially, I mean, tax is a big pain in the ass that you know, makes your balances like some crazy number. But for the most part, a lot of things that you buy, they're nice round numbers. You go and you buy and it's, it's in Mexico, it's 20 pesos for something, it's not 20, 78, or like these weird numbers. So you don't really need points. You sold me, Dan. I think we should all move to Mexico. <laughs> It was a good run. <laughs> we are still recording, Kim. I'm sorry. <laughs> some, some countries actually, and this may be illegal, but some countries actually make it to where you could take this dollar, 100 pennies, 50 cents a piece now. And I kind of just wasted my dollar. I might need it later, but I can tape it back together. <laughs> now you're going to burn a flag. <laughs> oh, man. No. That was tough to watch. <laughs> Chris, what were you going to say? It's worth a nickel anyway. Got around here in protest of the. Uh, yeah. Was that a first? The mall who got shot. Presidential candidate to ever tear up a dollar bill on. I, I and let's make it a debate. last. I that was that. Yeah, might as well set it on fire. Too yeah, hard. are you going to be mad if I light a cigar with a hundo on the next one? <laughs> uh, Daniel, you're not one to talk here. I think you actually there was pictures of dollar bills burning, hundred dollar bills, might add, in your video. Oh yeah. Did you watch your own video? Uh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, but it was yeah. it was politicians doing that symbolically. Right, but. But I saw it happen, and my heart hurt. Okay, hey, we're uh, just getting rid of the extra stuff that the Fed's printing. So you know, let me give you something you for decreasing inflation. <laughs> let me give the dog something else to chew on here before we go to our closing arguments. Let's talk about trade because that's something the president kind of gets to get a hold of. Is there any deals that you like? Do you hate them all? What what role does trade have with you as president? Three. I'm not. I, I'm a fan of open trade. No tariffs. Let business itself handle. Let business itself handle what is coming into and out of this country, just so long as it's not harmful to the people, or we'll get everybody sick. Yeah, that's. I mean, the government's not buying and trading or doing anything. They sh really should have no involvement in it for the most part. You know, I what I, I, the big advantage what I, of open trade is we end up using better things. So when you put a steel tariff, you end up having people use something inferior to steel. So first. I would get rid of all import tariffs and all that. But here's a more important thing. The sanctions the other way have a damaging cultural aspect. Aspect. So right now we can't sell luxury goods to North Korea. Like the literal thing that is the best advertisement for capitalism, we can't sell to North Korea. And that kind of stuff is stupid. I am 100% in favor of absolutely open trades, no tariffs, no sanctions, no import restrictions of any kind. Yeah, but have you seen the dictator's movie collection? It's very impressive. Wait, sorry, sorry, Kim, what was that? I said, have you seen the North Korean dictator's movie collection? It's very impressive. <laughs> you can at least supporting that? Hollywood. <laughs> out all the blockbuster videos it went under. <laughs> go somewhere. Now let me let me let me throw a little nuance here again, just to play devil's advocate. I am still a libertarian, everybody. But a lot of times, the president actually has the ability by working with these dictators to override these sanctions and override these problems because the sanctions not on our end north korea actually has the sanction on their end as well so what's the you know w would you would you see any of you i guess see any reason to step in and try to override that or work out a deal using your position to try and sure, absolutely happen? we're going to cover this probably a lot more when we talk about national security issues uh -huh. But basically, the best way to foster a healthy relationship is by encouraging free trade. Is all this distortion my stuff? Uh, just... Chris, can you mute your mic real quick? I'm sorry about oh. that. 
You're, you're okay. Go ahead, Kim. Okay. I'm sorry. I thought it was me. <laughs> um, yeah. One of the best ways to foster a healthy relationship on the international stage is through free trade. And we can, as libertarians, absolutely use the right of disassociation, disassociation by not trading you know, as individuals with countries that engage in human right practices or business practices that we find antithetical to our belief system. So there is absolute value in building healthy economic relationships. And as Arvin rightly pointed out, the exchange of superior products and services is going to incentivize every economy to rise. When we get better products in our country, it's going to encourage us to innovate and to progress. That is exactly what we want to do for the rest of the world. Like, as they said in Daredevil, a rising ship <laughs> brings the rest of them up. <laughs> I John, shouldn't have quoted Wilson Fisk, but hey, you, you also, get the point. <laughs> you also said Arvin was right again. That's two smacks from John. Oh, I know. Kim. That's <laughs> two smacks. That is, good point is a good talk point. About, like, we talk about like all these tariffs and like the reality is like, you know, if we put a tariff here on the U.S., um, you know, on imports, that's hurting our own people. And if North Korea does it, then they're hurting their own people. And, you know, if we want to get in there and we want to start saying like, hey, you can't do this, that is kind of foreign intervention in a way. I think we should try to negotiate with them to open that up. But at the same time, you know, what typically what, uh, you know, especially people like Trump do is they say, oh, well, uh, you've got tariffs on your end. We're going to put tariffs on our end. And that's nonsense because those hurt our people more. We need to we need to have nothing on our end. And just do what we can to try to convince people like, hey, you're going to benefit from this relationship if you free it up on your side, too. You're going to benefit your people. You're going to get better goods over over there. So it, it's you know, it makes sense for them to do that. People Absolutely. In other countries don't want to have to pay more. And the great thing is this. If we just get rid of our tariffs and show the benefits, other countries be like, oh, I want to pay less for these American goods. That helps us. Uh, but the really good thing is if we encourage that importation. Here's what happens in all those countries. You know, people in North Korea and Iran, wherever, the businessmen have to learn about American culture to sell to us. Their advertisers, their marketers, graphic designers, that's spreading American culture in a way that works. Instead of bombing people into agreeing with us, which is not a very effective strategy, we can actually say, listen, if you want to sell to us, learn about our culture, learn about the ideas of, 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 of gender equality, Look at the, learn about the ideas of liberalism, learn about the ideas of human rights, learn about freedom of press, learn about American culture, because it is a great culture. Yeah, we have a bad government, but we have a fantastic culture. I wanna spread that through trade instead of turn people away from it through war. Exactly. Yeah, Trade equals peace, too, because, you know, I'll tell you what would have stopped the Iraq war or the war in Afghanistan is if there was a bunch of factories over there that were supplying all the goods in, in Walmart and CVS or, or wherever, because I, all the employees and all the executives and shareholders would have been there testifying before Congress. You can't go in there and bomb Baghdad. You know, we, that's where all our factories are. We have we have five Walmarts in Baghdad. You're going to bomb those two. Um, you have a business relationship. And when you have a business relationship, you have a lot more uh, levers and variables to to negotiate deals where you don't have to you don't have to drop bombs. Um, and that's that's not the solution. So I, I think that Free trade is actually a, a solution to peace because when you have business interests over in a country, you probably don't want to be bombing that country. Actually, we do have a lot of business interests in other countries, and that's our justification for bombing them. <laughs> so I was going to say, right well, now our business well. <laughs> is incentivized to blow them up. Right? That's right. If you guys <laughs> not, if none of you studying the Keynesian system were set up in, I'm so disappointed. <laughs> All right, I want to respect our end time, guys. Uh, go ahead. I'll, I'll let you. I'll give you a, our roles. Yeah. As president, that is one of our roles is to negotiate with other countries. Uh, we're supposed to set up other people to keep a standing, uh, a standing relationship with them. But ultimately, it comes down to the president going to these countries and talking with all the leaders. Now we can free trade all day long but we will also be affected by other countries. If we get our system more towards the free trade side and get rid of tariffs, we will be able to negotiate better with the other countries to say, hey, look at how much our current industry is profiting from this. Maybe you want to reply in kind and stop doing the tariffs for your own people 
where it comes to our country. We cannot enforce our way of life on you, but hey, this is working out for us. Maybe you want to come into it. All right, guys. I just had one real quick thing. If, if you look in Hong Kong, they have a hundred percent tariff on cars and you know who hates that? People in Hong Kong, they're already fighting against as much as they can. I don't think that we need to worry about that. We need to get rid of the tariffs that are hurting Americans right now. All right. I, uh, let's, let's get to some closing statements. I want to respect everybody's time. You guys already give so much. Uh, again, I appreciate it. Uh, and we will start three minutes for each of these closing statements. We will start with Miss Kim Ruff. All right. <laughs> Okay, uh, one thing I want to say to your non-libertarian viewers, if there are indeed any, and I hope there are. They're despite... in the chat right now. Oh, oh, they're so mad. They're so triggered. <laughs> despite what people may think, the president has very little effect on the economy beyond fostering healthier international economic relationships, ending military interventionism and financing foreign nations, vetoing legislation that gives federal... Uh, aid or subsidies to state or local governments and easing or refusing to enforce all federal legislation that proposes to penalize people who refuse to have their natural right to property violated. So there are certain things you can do as a president, but you can't do all the things, which means that a lot of folks on the ground level, local and state, need to push against their legislators to make sure that these things happen. You have to be involved. And there's something that I wanted to say that my campaign asked me to say. When we started this campaign, we knew full well we were shooting for the moon, but we didn't do this because we were particularly, particularly interested in capturing it. We did this because it is our duty as libertarians to seize a microphone and speak into it, to find a podium and own it, and to use the stage as the pulpit from which we preach truth and what's the biggest stage we could possibly get. The president race, one of the few times most Americans bothered to vote, despite the fact that their city council has a heck of a lot more say about their daily lives than the knucklehead in the Oval Office does or should. We are doing this so we can make the jobs and lives of every down ballot candidate easier, to make the sales pitch done by volunteers at a fair easier. We are normalizing liberty for people who have been raised to believe freedom is slavery, war is peace, ignorance is strength. That duty doesn't change. It won't until we push through. We must stay the course no matter the outcome because we all know that we all know damn well what could happen if we don't. Our down ballot candidates will be left to once again twist in the wind. Our principles will be sacrificed for meaningless marginal gain and our volunteers will suffer yet another crushing defeat. We do this for them. This is why we fight and we want to fight with you beside you. Join us. We can be reached at our website, roughphillips2020.com our social media sites are at one 4 librty Reignite Liberty. My name is Kim Ruff, and I am seeking the Libertarian Party presidential nomination in 2020. And it's been a pleasure, guys. All right, fantastic. Let's move on to Arvind Vora. I'm running for president to end the welfare state and end the income tax. And part of that is what I believe a president can do and what a president should do. The most important role of a president is that of partner in chief. And if I'm president, I'm going to sit all day and just pardon everyone who refuses to pay taxes, pardon people, great heroes like Julian Assange, Ross Ulbricht and Edward Snowden. I'm going to pardon everyone who uses Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency in ways that the state doesn't like. But here's the great news. You can do that right now. You can, as a juror, do so much of what only a president can do. You can be a partner in chief. And today I ask you, if you are on a jury and there's somebody who's there for a victimless crime, whether that's a, a drug-related crime or a financial crime, something where, he said, where somebody says, I don't want to be robbed by government, so I simply won't allow it. I ask you to use the power that was given to you, to use the power that brought freedom of press to the United States and use it to bring, bring back financial freedom, freedom of property to the United States. If I'm the nominee, I promise you this, not only are you gonna hear more about pardoning and jury nullification, but just as a nominee, and even right now, I will encourage things like Bitcoin use, cryptocurrency use, which depends so much on network effects. As libertarians in 2020, we are going to face an historic choice. On one side, we're going to have actual libertarians, 
On the other side, we're going to have Republican moderates who agree with us on some minor and insignificant areas. We're going to have people on one side who are there to normalize liberty, as Kim just said, there to fight against this existing culture. And on the other side, we're going to have the people who will pander to this culture, doing their best to leave it unchanged. You've heard me say many times that this culture has produced this government. And if we knock down this government, it will recreate, I'm sorry, then this culture will recreate this exact government by tomorrow. But I also firmly and fundamentally believe that if we change this culture, then this culture all by itself will knock down this government at the city, state, local, and yes, federal level. We can end the income tax. We can live in a world where your labor is exchanged fairly for somebody else's labor, where you are no longer forced to spend the vast majority of your work to pay for immoral operations overseas or to lock your fellow man into, into government cages for daring to use a plant, for daring to enjoy themselves in the way that they see fit. Autonomy needs to be complete, personal autonomy, and yes, financial autonomy. If you wanna join my campaign, please go to votebora.com support our radio ads, support our door hangers, or join as a volunteer. We can use everybody we can get. Again, that website is votevora.com. All right, your closing statements, Christopher Marks. I'm Christopher Marks. You can find my, uh, you can find me uh, on my Facebook page, Christopher Marks President 2020. A vote for uh, Christopher Marks is not a vote for me. It's a vote for you. It's a vote. I am an ideal. My ideal is that the Libertarian Party is the party that puts the people's rights and interests above state and corporate privilege and interests. And as you've heard through this interview, this debate, as well as every other debate, I don't pander lip service through uh, through theory. I pander to you. I plea to you to get involved in the Christopher Marks for 2020 campaign because I have a plan. I have a direct plan of action that can and will revolutionize these United States from the federal level all the way uh, all the way across the United States and the mo and the individuals that will benefit benefit are you the individual constituency who is actually the one casting the vote. Put, it, put your name in the ballot and come to the it Marks for 2020 campaign and help me help you. Thank you. All right. Closing statement from, and this is his ballot name, folks. Daniel Taxation is Theft Berman. Let's hear you. So I've got three minutes, right? Taxation is theft. Taxation is theft. Taxation is theft. I'm okay, to two, three minutes are no. up. And <laughs> uh, unlegalized pineapple pizza. Um, no, actually, I want to tell you a story about a guy named Milton Friedman. Some of you guys have heard of him. Um, he went to China and he saw that they were building a road, but they were building a road with shovels. And he asked, where are the tractors? Where are the machines? Like, why are they doing this so inefficiently? And he was told that this is a jobs creation program. And by doing it with shovels, it takes longer. So that means there's more jobs. There's more work to be done. So he said, well, why not just give them spoons? And if you think about it, that's really, you know, when we look at our economy, we're always gauging how well our economy is doing on the job market. But we can't think about it like that because realistically, as Marvin, uh, as Arvin pointed out earlier, sorry, um, you know, we used to live in a world where uh, we would have two individuals that created a family, a mother and a father, and only one of them would be working. And now we live in a society where usually there are two income earners in a household. And how do we get from that? You know, everything is done more efficiently now. We have, we have automation and we have machines and now everything's more efficient and yet we're working even harder. Why is that? It doesn't make any sense. And the reality is there's this, there's this idea that the economy is only working if everybody's working. We should stop looking at it like that because the reality is five, 10, 20 years from now, we should all be working a lot less. That doesn't mean we should all be unemployed, but maybe instead of 40 hours a week, we should only be working 30 or 20. We hear, we hear this all the time from, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders who says, you know, oh, we should have three months off every year and, and not have to work. Now, of course, his plan is a little bit different. 
Um, but it's, you know, we should start looking at it like this. Um, you know, we should start looking at the fact that if we had enough doctors, if we had so many doctors, they could work half time and spend the rest of the time with their family. They'd still make plenty of money and everyone would be able to get the health care that they need because there would be so many doctors. And if you get rid of all the small jobs that are, that are, you know, basically doing tasks that don't take a whole lot of work and, and don't take any brain power, we can automate these jobs. That doesn't mean we're going to be unemployed and suffering because we don't have any money. What it means is that we're all going to have a higher standard of living because everything is going to be so easy for us to get. And that's really the type of society we need to move into. And we need to start thinking about that. And we need to start thinking about how do we transition there without government programs and people stealing from others to force our way into this happening. It will happen naturally. But we just have to look forward and see how that's going to come to play. You can visit my website, Berman2020.com. Uh, you can follow me, volunteer, and donate. Thank you. Great. Uh, let's move over to William Hurst. All right. Now, a lot of the questions tonight were asked about some things that the president has no authority over and some things the president does. As a note of caution, the president is kind of given the authority to make these decisions because of our progress being as partisan as they are. With that, with the power of I think we might be disconnected. This is unacceptable. We should we should have bills that come in front of the president to have a three quarter majority. That way, the president is not endued with that decision. The president should not be should be the last in line to say something about it if it is unconstitutional and it will hurt the people. But Congress itself needs to act on these on these bills and everything else that we that we are dealing with today as far as our economy and everything else across the board. Okay. And let's close with, yeah, let's close with Benjamin letter. <laughs> did you, uh, did you get knocked offline there, Hody? Uh, the zoom. Still, yeah. The zoom we, re reset on me. Are we still recording? Are we still live? We are still live and still recording. Wow. That's pretty impressive software. I um, <laughs> well, I guess this is the time I get to ramble for three minutes. Huh? <laughs> um, well, let's just hit on some of the same things I, I, I usually talk about uh, since I get to address libertarian community and in the, in the greater community as a whole out there. Um, yeah, they, that old saying that all politics is local, you know, really holds firm. Uh, a friend and I, a friend of mine and I were talking the other night and trying to figure out the difference between people that watch you know, football and wrestling and the people who watch Fox and CNN. We determined that the difference was that the people that watch Fox and CNN actually believed that they were more informed than the people that watch football and, uh, and wrestling. And, you know, what I see is a lot of people out there uh, distracted by the federal government, distracted uh, by these pundits. Uh, and sitting at home and, and yelling on the TV. And, and meanwhile, locally, we're getting fleeced. Um, uh, locally, this is where most of the abuse is happening. So um, I would really like to see uh, people across the country in, in mass become uh, involved in, in their local government, their local city councils, and their local county commissioners. And I, and I, I like to ask people to run. If you ever thought about running, please, you know, do it. Try it once, at least. Um, you know, and the other subject I like to talk about is, and Bernie sees it. Bernie is stealing part of my idea. Now, he's not talking about full rights restoration for fel felons. He wants to give felons the, the right to vote back so that, you know, they'll get suckered into voting for him. 
but I think we all here support uh, full the full restoration of, of rights uh, when people serve their debt to society. Once the debt is paid, you shouldn't be uh, char continuing to charge people or make people pay for the rest of their lives. Um, and there's, you know, almost like 30 million felons out there. And some of them just millions of them just got their vote, right to vote back. I think we as libertarians need to really make it known that this really is you know, and, and as as a as a felon, I can say this: this really is the best party for someone who's been convicted of of a felony. It, it truly is. Um, and then uh, I guess I'll close off with with legislation. A lot of the questions that we get asked, really, the solutions are legislation. You know, whether it's on the city or county level, or the, or the state or federal level. We need our candidates, not just being paper candidates or online candidates anymore. We need our, our candidates out there and our, and our parties drafting up this legislation. We need it to be ready to introduce in the event that somebody gets elected. Um, I don't know where I'm at time-wise, but- Three I, minutes on the button. All right, all right, you can find out more about me at binletter.com. Thanks folks. Okay. Again, candidates, thank you so much for your time. Listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Uh, please share this with your friends. Let them know uh, just what you're discussion, discussing. Let them know who you love, who you hate. The candidates need this kind of feedback. If you're interested, you can always talk to any of these guys directly. That's how I got a hold of them anyway. And uh, they'd be more than happy to answer your questions and, and talk with you. Um, again, I want to stress that this is, a, this is an investment. We're halfway through these debates. They've committed to 10 debates, two hours every other Thursday. They could be doing a lot of other stuff. Kim's on her honeymoon. Uh, Arvin's, it's his birthday today. I mean, they've just, they put aside so many things just Happy to. Happy birthday, Arvin. And yeah. These are the only <laughs> legitimate debates. <laughs> these are the only debates where the candidates don't know the questions in advance. Yeah, and... Uh, as we went over, that, that put off our Republican and Democratic rivals who did, uh, I attempted to and did establish contact with all of them, invited them, the Republicans and the Democrats, to these debates. So we may be getting a new libertarian around the corner. But again, guys, I respect your time. Thank you so much for giving it tonight. If you are listening, please support us on Patreon. It's how we can keep this whole thing going. It's how we live. Patreon.com slash We Are Libertarians. And uh, again, if you're already a, a, a sponsor, I really appreciate it. But keep going with the questions, guys. Again, I'm very grateful for your time. You all enjoy your evening and keep fueling the fires of liberty. <laughs>